A queue operates like a line of customers waiting to pay a cashier. When new buyers arrive, they go to the end of the line, which is how the insertion operation works in a queue. The cashier always serves the customer at the beginning of the line, which is similar to reading from the queue. When the customer completes the purchase, they leave the line. This represents the delete operation. The customer who has been in the line for the longest time is the first to leave. We call this property first in, first out. When working with queues, the insert, delete, and read operations are usually called NQ, DQ, and front. But how can we implement this data structure? We can use an array of size n to efficiently implement the queue that can store up to n elements. Note that the queue size is different from the underlying array size. To distinguish between the two, we'll refer to the number of elements in the queue as size and the total number of slots in the array as capacity. The queue data will be stored in the array, but not every slot will have an element. So we need to know queue's beginning and end. We'll call them the head and the tail. The head points to the first element in the queue while the tail points to the slot after the last element in the queue. We will also store the size of the queue. To enqueue a new element, we add it after the last element. This is an index that the tail points to. After adding an element, we move the tail to the next slot. But what if there is no more space in the underlying array, which we can check by comparing the size and the capacity? We have two options. We can raise an error, or an alternative is to create a bigger array and move all the elements there. Then we can add the new element, which is what most libraries do. To dequeue the first element, we change the head to point to the next element. Note that we don't have to explicitly delete the element from the array, since the head and the tail already provide enough information. And finally, when using queues, we usually want to read the first element. We can implement this by returning the element stored at the slot that the head points to. You may notice that after enqueuing and dequeuing elements for some time, the head and the tail eventually reach the end of the array. Even though there may be only a few elements in the queue, we could still run out of free slots unless we do something about it. To address this problem, once the tail reaches the end, we move it to the beginning of the array. This is of course, assuming that there is enough space. We use the same idea when dequeuing elements and incrementing the head. You may be wondering, why are we tracking the size in the first place? Can't we derive it given the head and the tail? For example, can we subtract the head from the tail while also handling the wraparound case to compute the size? Well, almost. The problem is, we need to distinguish between the queue being empty and using the full capacity. In both cases, the head and the tail would be the same, so we need more information to distinguish between the two states. So, tracking size independently of the head and tail helps us solve this problem. Let's see an example of a problem that a queue can solve. Imagine writing a server that receives requests to execute the tasks as soon as possible. One way this could work is for the server to receive a task and immediately start processing it. But what happens if there is a burst of tasks and our server can only process one at a time? The new task would be dropped, unless the server stores them somewhere. Instead of dropping new tasks while the server is busy, they are added to the queue. The server would then process the tasks from the queue in the order they were received. In general, queues are very useful for algorithms that need to delay execution of tasks while preserving the order. We will see more examples when we talk about graph algorithms in later videos. Now let's talk about stacks. A stack operates like a bunch of dirty plates placed on each other. When you finish eating, you may put a plate on top of the pile, which is how the insertion operation works in a stack. If you want to wash the dishes, you will take the plate from the top of the pile. This is how the deletion operation works in stack. 
When you look at the pile of dirty plates, you only see the top one, which is how the read operation works. The plate that was last added on top of the pile is the first to be washed. We call this property last in, first out. Insert, delete and read operations are usually called push, pop and top. Now, let's see how to implement a stack data structure. Similar to queues, we can use an array of size n to efficiently implement a stack that can store up to n elements. We will refer to the number of elements in the stack as size and the total number of slots as capacity. The elements in the stack will be stored in the array slots. The beginning of the array will represent the bottom of the stack and it will always be at index 0. Since we can only add and delete elements from the top of the stack, we need to know the index of the top element. This is a slot at index size minus 1. To push a new element, we add it after the last element, which is the index equal to the size. After pushing an element, we increment the size. If no more space exists in the array, we can raise an error or create a bigger array, similar to what we did with queues. To pop the element, we can simply decrement the size by 1. Finally, to read the top of the stack, we return the element at index size minus 1. And that's all there is about stacks. Let's see an example of a problem that a stack can help us solve. Imagine that you're implementing a web browser and want to implement back and forwards functionality. For example, Say that you are at techwithnicola.com website and click on the Queues and Stacks page. After reading the post, you may want to go back and you press the back button in your browser. The browser remembers that the previous page was techwithnicola.com and takes you there. Similarly, the Go Forward functionality would take you to the Queues and Stacks page again. You may notice that the last visited page is also the first one that you will visit after going back or forward which is basically the same as the last in, first out policy. So how can we solve this problem? We can use two stacks, one for storing the backward pages and one for storing the forward pages. We will also keep track of the active page. When you open a new page, the current active page is pushed on the backward stack. The process is repeated each time we open a link. To go back, we first push the active page to the forward stack. Then we pop the top from the backward stack and set the active page to it. The approach is similar when going forward, except that we invert backwards and forward stacks. Oh, and there is one more thing. What happens if you go backwards and then open a page by clicking on the link? In this case, we'd like to forget about the forward history, so we pop all the elements from the forward stack. And that's it, we have a solution for implementing browser history. So what's the time complexity of these operations? All operations in both stacks and queues provide constant runtime complexity and linear memory complexity. The main difference between stacks and queues is that stacks operate on the last in first out, while queues operate on the first in first out principle. This means that they provide different ways of accessing and manipulating data, making them useful for various types of problems. I truly hope you enjoyed this video as much as I enjoyed creating it for you. If you found value in what you've seen, please consider hitting that like button, subscribe to the channel and turning on notifications. Your support means the world to me and it enables me to continue bringing you more exciting content. Thank you for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.